Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Chat episode 199, featuring the first slice of my interview with Mr. Jeff Tunnell, the founder of Dynamics and an all-around groovy guy. This part of the interview, we focus in on his early days, his roots in the gaming industry, how he uh, got started by programming and then forming uh, software studios, of which he's uh, founded quite a number, as we'll see. And we also talk about Arctic Fox and what he thinks about the App Store. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Jeff Tunnell. All right, folks, I am here with the great Jeff Tunnell. He's a producer, programmer, designer. He's uh, got a band called The Procrastinators. He does Olympic weightlifting. And I guess he's not busy enough because he's just uh, got a farm now, a fur farm. I guess that makes you uh, about the second game developer I've ever interviewed who apparently can survive with ele <laughs> without electricity. <laughs> so how are you doing today, Jeff? I'm doing great. <laughs> Uh, so what is your what are some of your latest uh, projects? I know you're working with the Spotkin and a game that I definitely want to talk about called Contraption Maker. Sure. Um, yeah, our, my latest company is Spotkin, and it's um, we've been making games for a long time, and this is just sort of a culmination of everything I've learned over the years. There's only five of us, and we're all partners, and we use a couple other um, outside contractors to help us go. Uh, we, we have an artist since in Russia and that kind of thing, but I think that the current generation of game making is uh, small agile companies that can, you know, turn on a dime and, it, and they don't suck up a lot of money. So that's that's where we're headed with this one. We really concentrate on innovative designs. We hope and um, building up IPs and different different kind of incubating different ideas, and then we can spin them out into different companies if they do take off. So that's what we're doing. Speaking of things spinning, uh, Contraption Maker, is that a, uh, an incarnation of the old Incredible Machines game that everybody loves so much? Yeah, well, of course, yes. The, um, the Incredible Machine was the, I, I don't know, it was, it was my favorite game that we ever worked, that I've ever worked on in my entire career. And in fact, pretty much everybody that's on the, on the team, we pulled together the entire old team that's, that worked on it. Uh, we've got Kevin Ryan, who was the co-designer and, and the main programmer on the Incredible Machine. And we have Brian Hahn, who was the artist, and we've even brought back Tim Clark to do the music. So we're um, we, we, that's the entire original team. <laughs> Incredible Machine it was a very small project at the time, um, but but I have a saying that uh, you know m musicians better play their old their old hits, or nobody's going to come to their concerts. <laughs> and, you know, uh, as much fun as it is to make new new games and so forth, um, going back and exploring something that we did in the early '90s has just been awesome and, and like I said it was my favorite game that we ever worked on and it's still it's unbelievable how much new new how many new ideas we can bring to this project as we as we've been working on it it's going to be a Facebook game or an iPhone game oh absolutely not no we we're um, we're starting off on PC and, and Mac and we're uh, we already have our Steam distribution agreement in place, and so it'll launch on Steam. In fact, we're playing it on Steam right now for our. It, it feels just just last week it came up on Steam, and it feels starts to feel really good when you go out on Steam and there it says Contraption Maker, and you click it and downloads and runs full screen. It, it feels really good. I was uh, reading your blog post, and I definitely want to post a link to that because it's a, some really good posts there. I think that fans of this show would like to read. But I saw one that really caught my eye about oh sort of ways that you think the App Store could be improved. and You have a problem with the way that they, the App Store displays and organizes the games. And I think I we must have read the same book by Chris Hansen because I saw the term long tail uh, there in the, in the post. So I wonder if you could elaborate on this and sort of what what, what do you find uh, wrong with the, with the App Store? Yeah, it's not just the App Store. I think both App Stores, the, the Play Store from Google and the App Store by Apple are both incredibly broken. Uh, I mean, it's but I think my saying is they're the most successful, most broken product of all time. Um, they, they, but you have to look that if the app economy is going to really kind of take over the internet, there's so many things that need to be fixed in order for it to work like the internet did. Right now, the app stores are just set up to basically sell the top 200 titles. So you have you know close to 800,000 titles in both stores. And maybe the top 200 are actually making money. 
And the reason for that is, I mean, actually, I gave 10 reasons in my blog post. There's, there's 10 good reasons. There's probably 20 good reasons, but, but I gave 10. But the, the absolute main one is just the reliance on three charts. You know, your top down, your top paid, your top free, and your top grossing. And, and I think that because they're relying on those charts, there's all this weird gaming going on and people using bots to buy products and buying their own products and, and all of that kind of thing. So that because all you're trying to do is game this one simple chart or there's three ch simple charts. And that's the only me discovery mechanism in the entire store. And there's so many different ways that they could... I mean, look at this. We're talking about Google. They're building working self-driving cars and they can't solve the discovery system in their own app store when they they solved the discovery they just solved this discovery problem for the entire internet with search i mean they remember the first time you ever used google search and typed in it was like oh, this is awesome this actually works and and yet they don't they can't fix it for their app store i, I think it's ridiculous i don't think i don't think they've concentrated on it because they haven't had to because they, they still have they have eight hundred thousand apps in there. They have millions of developers trying to create apps and throw them at them and so they don't have to and they you know they, they tout that you know Apple just touted that they paid out ten billion dollars. Well they have, but it's concentrated. Just in, I mean this is the smallest concentration you've ever seen. There is no long tail. The long tail is when I can go out and I can find a niche audience and I can make a niche product, say, I don't know, trophy bass fishing for instance, like we did uh, on the PC back in the day and find an audience for that, but there's no way for the audience to know that that product even exists. I don't care if it's good or bad or indifferent product. You know, people can say that good products will float to the top, and they will. 200 of them will, and the rest of them are going to be gone. I've, I've, it's heartbreaking. I've played incredible games that never charted, and, and, there, and there's no way for the developers to get them to chart once they've launched. And so I think that, that is an, that's something this absolutely has to be fixed. And, and like I said, there's 10 ideas there, and I'm sure there's 100 more ideas to fix it. But until they need to, they're not going to fix it. Yeah, it's refreshing to hear somebody that's a little critical of the, of the structure, because it seems like all the other developers, developers I've had on have been very sort of optimistic about their chances on the, you know, to make apps. Well, it, it was a very indie-friendly optimistic place to be two years ago you know because you could see the lightning strike hits right you you were happened to be in the right place at the right time and you made uh, I, I don't know even just a, a real Angry simple birds. little game that happened Angry Birds you know for instance that and everybody thought well if Angry Birds can make it my game can make it too and I get I get the same shelf space as the big guys but in reality you don't with all the stuff that all the underbelly of what's going on in the gaming of the app stores, uh, you, as a little guy, you don't stand a chance. Even if they're not gaming it, even if all they're doing is buying installs, you have no way of competing. Let's get into the, the history then. So I was really wanting to know, learn more about your background, you know, before you founded uh, uh, Dynamics. Apparently you know quite a bit about programming, which uh, seemed, might perhaps be a little bit unusual for, uh, for a publisher. So I just wonder if you could sort of take me through how you, you got into the business. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, I'm not a great programmer. I understand a little bit about programming, and, and I did some programming in, in AppleSoft Basic and, you know, used little plugins and things like that because I, I never could figure out assembly language. <laughs> I, I ran up against that barrier, and and, and, I, and my partner at the time was Damon Sly, who, who wrote all of our simulations at Dynamics, and and I had him write a little routine for me so I could plug it into, into my game. I actually I wrote a, a kid's art program and I wanted a visual catalog of all the um, all the pictures that the kids had made and so Damon wrote this little shrink utility for me and, and it was in assembly language and, and I got it back and it was just an incredible piece of art <laughs> and I thought I, I, I need to learn to be a better businessman and a better designer because I'm not going to be a programmer so so um, I think that that I you know I knew enough about programming that I could um, talk to good programmers and understand what was going on with them and I could I could find good programmers and I think that that's one of the things that's helped me um, be able to create these businesses and um, and I've also also been really willing to um, partner with people that that knew a lot more than me about programmer like for instance Damon he was the best programmer I'd ever worked with at the time and so it's just that's that's my background um, 
I happen to have a biology degree. I have no idea why I know about business. I, I just learned it. <laughs> it was the, the book Learning MBA, you know. So um, I just, and the school of hard knocks, basically. You start off and just, all I wanted to do was make these games. I have no idea why I wanted to make games. It was just, it was just very compelling to me. Um, the very first time I ever saw games, I said, I want to do that. And so just by sheer force of will, we, we figured out how to do it. Do you think it's important and maybe perhaps unusual for a publisher to be even a, your level of familiarity with programming? Um, well, I mean, I'm not I'm not exactly a publisher right now. You know, I'm I I do pro I'm a producer, producer. Okay. So, and a designer and a director and and um, I, I would say that you know design skills are probably my best my my strongest um, talent, and so I just I, I I'm also I'm a good pattern manager. I'm out, you know, constantly just I'm the the guy that has to suck in all the information and spit it out the other end and figure out which where we should go and you know I, like I say it I always say it's, it's like it's a really hard job to live 5 minutes in the future. And if you can just live 5 minutes in the future you kind of have an idea of where we're going to go and and uh I've been lucky enough times that that it's uh it's worked out for us. Let's go back to uh, 1984 then, when I had that uh, you found a dynamics with the uh, Damon Sly, apparently in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, did you have some help from Ken Williams getting started? Uh, well, we didn't even know Ken Williams then. Didn't even know him. No, when we first started dynamics, it was just Damon and I, and I was working on um, computer uh, electronic playground, that kid program that I was telling you about, and I owned a, a software retail store. And it was actually, I think, one of the first software retail stores in the world. We didn't make a big deal out of that, but, but we did have it. And that's why I actually met Damon. And Damon was working on Stellar 7. And he would just come into my store and... and uh, what was the name of the store? It was, it was called Computer Tutor. And um, we had a little retail store down on... I think it was maybe 800 square feet or something. And on the walls, we had all the little baggies you know this was in 1984 so we sold mostly Apple and Commodore and then the PC came out and we sold PC software and uh, Damon would just come in the store all the time and and we started talking and talking and talking we said hey let's start a software development company <laughs> so so we, we threw in together and I sold the store and raised a little bit of money which was really hard back in those days and and we we started um, Dynamics so what were some of your your first first uh, releases then? You mentioned the electronic playground. Yeah, and that was you know that that was a uh, we sold I don't know a couple thousand copies of that or something. But Stellar Seven was the one that did really well for us. Um, we started working with Chris Cole and Paul Bowman and and Chris Chris wrote a a product called Temple of App Shy that we had Pe Penguin um, published for us, and then we uh, then we ended up getting a it. it, it we were working with the smaller publishers and trying to put our own stuff out, and we didn't have enough money to do that, so we started working with Electronic Arts. And the first product that we put out with Electronic Arts was Arctic Fox. Uh, it's one of my favorites on the Amiga. Yeah. And that was on the Amiga, and then we ended up porting that over to other. And that was sort of, you know, we started really taking off then, and, and, and we, we grew a little bit, and we started doing some products for Activision. And um, it wasn't until... Probably, so this was in 84, you know, 84, 85 time frame. And then around 89 is when we actually met Ken Williams. And that was, he came in and, and uh, wanted to um, license our 3D technology for his helicopter simulation game. I don't know if you remember that one. And he, uh, after a week or so, he just said, why don't I just buy your company? And so we were the first acquisition for Sierra. And, you know, they, at the time, I think they had a $12 million valuation. They were a publicly traded company with a $12 million valuation, which is, which is crazy nowadays because, you know, a lot of uh, A-round startups get more than that and just VC money. But, they, you know, they ended up, we, st we went into a $12 million valuation and, and went, you know, Sierra went all the way to a billion dollar valuation, which was, that was really good for us. We, we were with Sierra, I, I stayed with Sierra for eight years, I think, which is unusual after you like, you like working with those, with those guys? Ken Williams was awesome. 
he, he, I mean, still is awesome. He doesn't, he doesn't do games anymore, but he was, he was great to work with. He gave us a lot of leeway. He, he gave us good direction, but mostly he gave us a lot of leeway and, and, you know, money and a sales force to go out and sell our products. And so it was, it was one of the best things I ever did in my career was to work with Ken Williams. Let's go back to Arctic Fox uh, for a second. I just sure. want to hear more about this game, sort of the, so maybe some insights on how it was developed. Um, well, Arctic Fox was, was interesting. At that time, there was just a few of us at, at Dynamics. Or, and when we, it was, we, we had a bunch of C++ experience because we were working on a word processor on the side. If you can believe that. We were working on games. Because at the very, very earliest days of the games, I knew I wanted to make games. I just didn't know if we could make a living making games. So um, one of our projects was uh, something we called it Personal Productivity or P2. And it was uh, sort of a, uh, I think there was, Bruderbund had a product, Kid Rider or something like that. And it was a little too simplistic, so we wanted somewhere between, um, I think it was, I don't remember what the big word processors were at the time and, and, and Kid Writer. So, so we were trying to do something really simple that normal people could use. But, but we chose C++ or C at the time as the language and turned out that that was a good bet. And that ended up being the language of the future. And so when the, Art, and when the Amiga came along, the way you programmed it was in C. And so because of that, that experience we had, EA wanted us to work on the Amiga. So we were one of the chosen companies got to work on the Amiga, which the Amiga was never a very good financial success, but it definitely pointed the direction where everything was going to go with, you know, advanced graphics and coprocessors and things like that. So we, we had a, you know, we were a, a year or so ahead of everybody else in terms of those kinds of games. And so it really helped us out as, as a technology move forward. And so, but it was interesting. We had, um, everything was developed with, um, you would develop everything on a PC and then target the machine. So we had a wooden box Amigo sitting over here, and we had a PC sitting here. And PCs at the time were uh, pretty slow, if you remember, like an 8088 processor, and it was a big deal if you had a, hard, a five gigabyte hard drive that, you know, I mean a five megabyte hard drive. Five megabyte hard drives cost $2,500 back then. And so we would, but we, we used a, um, you would compile on the PC and then send it over this wire to the, to the Amiga, and it would take 45 minutes per compile. And so, you know, luckily Damon and, and Kevin were pretty, they, they, they would make a lot of changes, but they were really detail-oriented, and so they could make a lot of changes in those 45 minutes. But, I mean, imagine that, a compiler, 45-minute turnaround time. So every bug you wanted to fix, every little thing, was 45 minutes. And so it's pretty amazing what they did. You know, created a, a 3D with hidden lines and, and filled in polygons and all that kind of stuff for Arctic Fox. I mean, unfortunately, it ran at, you know, 10 frames a second or something like that, but still worked. And, uh, and it was a really fun game. So, and then, then we had to take that to, like I said, we ended up porting it to the Commodore and to the Apple. And, and those were actually really, really successful products, and that helped us move along. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with uh, Mr. Jeff Tunnell. We'll probably have enough, enough material here for maybe two, maybe even three more episodes. A lot of great stuff coming up, so uh, stay tuned for that. As always, I want to uh, thank you if you have uh, supported the show. A lot of you guys have been stepping up to the plate lately, so uh, thank you very much for that. As uh, always, if you'd like to subscribe, uh, you can do so for as little as a dollar a week. A lot of people have gone with that option. It uh, might not sound like a lot to you guys, but it actually does add up. It makes quite a difference. So if you'd like to uh, set up that, just go to armchairarcade.com, look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner of the page, and takes a few seconds and you'll be doing me a great service and I'll greatly greatly appreciate it now what about that uh, uh, uh. <laughs> ale of the week uh, this week I've got a a uh, little number here called the Great Northern Porter. This is out of the Summit Brewing Company, and uh, they're located in St. Paul, Minnesota, just a, maybe an hour and a half away. Unfortunately, there's no other information on the bottle that I can see. Um, so, 
<laughs> great northern porter. I guess we'll see how great it is. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this great northern porter here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this and trying to decide what I think about the, the aroma. It's uh, sort of got that chocolatey, nutty uh, sort of scent that you get with uh, most porters and stouts. And nothing really unusual there. But anyway, let's give it a taste. Uh, a little bit bitter, a very thin. Usually I expect a porter and these uh, stouts to be a bit thicker and creamier, so I'm a little disappointed with that. Um, Taste-wise, though, it is it is relatively thin. You do get some bitterness, um, maybe a little hint of a, a coffee-like flavor, a little nuttiness in there. Uh, not a whole lot going on here in the flavor department. Uh, not bad, though. It definitely doesn't have a bad taste. I guess I'll go maybe uh, two out of five drinking horns on this. Um, if you're looking for something with a lot of uh, punch, you know, I'd look elsewhere. If you want something uh, with a bit more subtle, something kind of smooth, I guess you could drink probably a six-pack of these and not fuel anything. Uh, this wouldn't be a bad choice. Uh, Summit Great Northern Porter. Anyway, let's wrap up uh, with a quotation. And I was looking for something about business, and I came across a quotation from Isaac Asimov, the science fiction writer. You know, who would have thunk it? But it's a good quotation, and I think you'll find it uh, to be pretty relevant. It goes something like this. It takes more than capital to start a business. You also need an AID degree, advertising, initiative, and dynamics. See you guys next week. George, you know, I was wondering, like, like if you were traveling through outer space, I mean, like you're going real fast, like the speed of light, you know? And all of a sudden, you start screaming, ah, ah, you think that your brain would blow up?